Hundreds of service providers petition Morobe Provincial Government. Mulbaya tribes make peace months after killing of one man. And Pomgen opens palliative care ward. Good evening and thanks for joining us for Tuesday's news. I'm Charmaine Poriambe. 400 service providers petitioned the Morobe Provincial Government to sack the provincial treasurer following the delay in their payments since 2013. Deputy Governor Willie Simbisi told the service providers today that their concern would be brought to the authorities for deliberation. Simbisi said the 400 service providers should be paid their outstanding payment of 54 million kina before 2021. Morbes Deputy Governor Willie Simbisi addressed the service providers this morning and told them that their outstanding payments at the cost of 54 million kina would be paid off by next week onwards. We want the first 34 claims to be paid out today and they continue to look into it and onwards next week they must make sure all the claims must be paid out. Thank you. Thank you. Simbisi said there shouldn't be any issues of debt servicing in 2021. His response follows a petition presented to the Morbe Provincial Government today by the service providers. They have been following up on their outstanding payments with the Morbe Provincial Government since 2014. I was the provincial treasurer during the time of Mr. Wenge, Kelly Naru, and down at the time. During the time in 2013 downwards, there was no debt servicing. Uh, that agenda of debt servicing came in in 2014 when I left this office and transferred to Waigani. So the debt servicing, when my committee and my staff here went through, the total of 54 million from 2014 up to 2018. I came in in 2019. When I came in, I put a public notice. I put a notice up and I said, whoever does have the outstanding uh, with the provincial government, come forward. Provide your documents so that we must transparently deal with all those that have been complaining, putting the house cry here. We need to get rid of this. So we put a public notice up and all the contractors came in. Provincial Treasurer Andrew Namuesh said there are five procedures that need to be done before a cheque is released. They're talking about uh, claims not passing through the system. With the introduction of the IPMS system, there is the blockage there, meaning that in, with the figure system, it's all finance. With the new IPMS system, we have online and we have offline. Offline meaning when the finance form 3 and 4 goes in, the PS signs. When it comes through the here, we check the documents. If the documents are okay, it will be returned back to PA for his online. It means that he has to give approval before we write a check here. You see, this system sometimes delay the processes. We are getting the blame. It's not finance. It's the system. According to Namuesh Morbes Provincial Executive Council formed a debt servicing committee that also has a list of service providers awaiting payments. The debt servicing committee did not come with the terms of reference which I require here in order for us to look at the terms of conference, the period of that uh, period of debt committee, what are the purpose of the establishment before we can up until now I have not seen any terms of reference from the debt servicing committee. In that committee, they have established uh, to realize that they have 100 claims, while we have so many claims outstanding. Our record, we have 300 claims. Their record is only 300. Uh, sorry, only 100. So they came up with the list without evidences. They don't have any records. Only the finance have the records of the payments. Morbes Provincial Treasury Office is the only office adding all the finances in the province. We realized that many of those contractors who came and showed there, they're double dipping the government. So I had to put a stop and say, no, you have already got yours. So they were very angry. They were angry, that's why they came. I called them in here and I told them, this is what we are gonna do. We will look at PSTB approved claims first. After the PSTB approved claims, then we will look at the higher car claims. After the higher car claims, then we will look at all the money market we have officers, we have politicians who have borrowed from outside. They are trying to use the system to get rich. 
which I said no. The system is here for us to deliver services to the people. It's not for us to get the money outside doing what we want without the acquittance in the system, then you come and ask for reimbursement. The provincial treasurer said decisions made by PEC should be in line with the Financial Management Act. They're talking about removing me here. I'm not scared of moving out because I've been moving out from here. I was faced by the politicians. I took them to court because of the misuse. When I was down in Medang, I took John Key to court. I took provincial administrator there. I locked them up and then I went to Port Mosby. I will still stand for transparency, accountability and honesty. That's my motto. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News, Lay. Peace was finally made between two neighboring tribes of Munjika and Nenga in Mulbaya electorate from a death which occurred on January 1st this year. A young man from the Nenga tribe was killed after an argument with a cousin who was under the influence of alcohol. The compensation ceremony which occurred last Friday saw peace between the neighboring tribes with the presentation of 150,000 kina including traditional wealth of animals. Animals. The neighboring tribesmen retaliated and burned 18 houses at the Kuruk area of Western Highlands. Animals were killed and food gardens destroyed. The conflict affected schools, churches, and health services. All young boy been come up and die. Trill of beer, lot of drug, steam, homebrew. Now mebla leaders, mebla looking for some display passing. Them so come affect them. All get the innocent man. Lord, this plan me take him initiative. Lord, come up and bring him this la peace, come in Jalong. This la community blow me. The tribes decided at the peace ceremony to stop producing and consuming alcohol and marijuana. They also acknowledged that drug and alcohol abuse is destroying lives and disrupting services. Compensation ceremonies are expensive and burden on communities, but it is one of the few ways of keeping peace in the rural communities of PNG. Of this year, we will have a big community lot doing, and we will have giving Thanksgiving call of God. Now this will all go something by, as directed by the committee, we will have a stop all this. The Monjika tribe paid the Nangas 150,000 kina. Part of the compensation included 150 pigs, 18 cows, 4 horses and a goat and cascas. This was to show the sympathy of the loss of one of the youths. One is anti lig mibla megi lena mibla lagin peace lo kama blo community blo mibla long province blo mibla na kandre saul. The Nangas accepted the compensation payment and peace was finally made. Basinata Yama, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. Still in Western Highlands, Police Minister Brian Kramer, Commissioner David Manning and the rank and file of the Royal Papua New Guinea Constabulary attended the funeral service of the late Eastern and Commander Assistant Commissioner of Police Nema Mondiai in Mount Hagen yesterday. Minister Kramer announced at the funeral service that late Nema Mondia is the first recipient of the PN, rather RPNGC Golden Handshake. It is a new program recognized recognizing long-serving members of RPNGC. The casket of the late ACP was flown from Port Moresby to Mount Hagen yesterday before being taken to his resting place at Waterboom in Eastern Highlands. He received a standing ovation from the public for the last time when fellow comrades brought his casket to the Mount Hagen police station for a minute of silence. Late Mondiai was known as a disciplined officer until his passing last week of heart failure. So much from you in terms of demonstrated high quality leadership, democracy, the rule of law, justice, and equality. These are feelings of building a strong nation. Among the mourners who came to pay their respect at the funeral service in Mount Hagen was former police commissioner Sir Tom Kulunga, civil aviation minister Jelta Wong, and Coroba Lake Copiago MP Petrus Thomas. It's a project city that brings us every government and also the breakdown. Australia breakdown with the breakdown of one year. And we left this up for some time. 
Nema Mondia joined the constabulary in May 1975 and served in the rank and file of RPNGC for 45 years. He was a dedicated police officer who believed in humanity and upheld democracy as a pillar of nation building. David Manning urged policemen and women to carry the legacy of late Mondiai, who dedicated his life to the force. The dedication of all that, such as Mr. Mondiai. The baton has changed hands. It is now up to the new guard who was the bus for here to honor the sacrifices and commitment and take the constable forward to new heights. After knowing about the late ACP's history in the constabulary, Minister Kramer made the decision that the first RPNGC Golden Handshake will go to late Nema Mondiai. Golden Handshake is an introduced reform in the RPNGC for the government to recognize distinguished service of police personnel when they reach the retirement age of 65. We want the member when serving Turn long him inside my force, I got distinguished service, good luck background, no I want the wrong and make him inside my voice, force, then government must look sorry for him. For not the country that is now calling golden handshake, no you second one of us are, not to look sorry for you, finish paying by Uxim, long service leave by Uxim, superannuation given by Uxim, now government by adding again, want the more, look sorry for you. His body was taken to Waterboom today and handed over to family members. Vasinat Yama, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. There is a need to provide more than just medical care to patients whose health conditions have really deteriorated. The Sir Theophilus George Foundation realized this need and has built self-contained private rooms for these special patients at the Port Moresby General Hospital. The palliative care ward was opened on Monday by Health Minister Sepuka Temu. Palliative care is specialized medical care for people living with a serious illness. This type of care is focused on providing relief from the symptoms and stress of the illness. As the Port Moresby General Hospital works towards its goal of being a certified level 7 hospital that offers specialized service, this particular service is vital in reaching that status. Thanks to the Sir Theophilus George Foundation, the hospital opened its palliative care ward on Monday. When I was part of the decision to appoint Sir Theo as the board chairman of this hospital, and saw him spending more time here than the hotel in Airways, I was worried that the hotel would be run down. It's a wonderful occasion for us to have our very first palliative care board and thank you to the Sathio Foundation. Sepuka described palliative care as the true Melanesian spirit of care. Palliative care to me Amy out him true true Melanesian spirit of care. You know the one talk system we go behind, we hold their hands, we pray with them, we bring the pastor, we bring the best nurse, you may change him napkin carry me go to the toilet, come back again, what do you want? For example, the cancer cases who are terminally healed. Huh? So these kind of patients in the terminal stage, we've got to care for them, uh, give them the spiritual support, give them the proper pain management, uh, feed them properly, uh, community support. So they need to stay in a ideal uh, environment. A tour of the room reflects a hotel room with its own bathroom and closet and air condition. Construction for the palliative care ward started on the 23rd of July 2019. Because of the cost that will be associated in running this service, certain fees will apply but not to all patients. This is one of the services the hospital will utilize its partnership with Health Insurer PHA. Those who can afford through that insurance can come and pay and use our facility so we support those who cannot afford at all. So this partnership is basically to support uh, uh, those who cannot afford so that we continue to provide a quality service like this. With the palliative care unit opening, the hospital is now looking forward to the completion of the cancer ward. Elizabeth Bradshaw, the women 
rather woman at the center of the debate concerning the engagement of New Guinea Biomed, the company set up to find a cure for COVID-19, spoke to the media today. Bradshaw, together with a group of scientists, are said to benefit from a 10 million Kina government funding to conduct tests for COVID-19. While the Prime Minister has given his approval, the opposition has labeled this a scam. Because this Elizabeth Bradshaw is the same person that has, was involved in the 10 million kina payment to Morobe provincial government through Saul employers. So you got to monitor and follow what's happening. And is this what we are seeing? The reemergence of the WhatsApp link, uh, leak from Pangu Party. The involvement of Pangu Party in all this. I have spoken to a few doctors. They all come up or came up to me and said it's a scam. Now I want to tell this country it is a total lie. It is a total lie. It is not true. Um, one challenge to the politicians out there and the leaders of this country. I suggest before you run to the media, you have to have facts and figures. You have to have hard and evidence to attack your citizens. As a citizen of this country, I feel totally ashamed that the opposition leader of this country has single-handedly called my name out in public media and has destroyed me. I want to also um, state, he said, he does not question the qualification and intelligence of the medical and scientific team, but he was concerned of the involvement of Elizabeth Bradshaw as shareholder and a director of the company because her involvement of another questionable funding for legal bills in the Morabe province, and that is in today's newspaper, Post Korea, page four. He's questioning my credibility on a false statement the opposition leader has the muscles to bring me to social media, every media platform to destroy me. What have I done wrong? You're watching National MTV News. We'll have more of the day's stories after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the news. Former National Planning Minister Richard Maru says the lack of investment in water sanitation and hygiene programs at district levels will delay the national government's aim in providing clean water supply to at least 70% of Papua New Guineans come 2030. As former Planning Minister Maru made these comments today when presenting a funding support to a contractor to build a water supply system for Kubalia in Yanguru Sausia district. The WASH policy introduced by the O'Neill Abel government is a 15-year development program that aims to make clean water and proper sanitation facilities accessible to more than three-quarters of the total population in PNG. As former minister responsible for the WASH policy, Richard Maru, says not many districts are implementing the WASH projects. When I was planning minister, I started to advertise to get all the schools in so we can start putting WASH programs in all the schools through planning and donor partners. I insisted, took the submission to cabinet and merged Adirano and Water PNG so we have one utility remove the two boats, save 10 million a year, and start talking about in reinvesting that in district towns that should have wash. After I left, there's no leadership in wash at all in this country. No one even talks about wash anymore. Now, how do you achieve a target of 70% coverage in 10 years when you don't even talk about it, when you have no plan, when you're not implementing a plan towards achieving the target? Even in Port Mosby, accessibility to clean drinking water is a challenge. These mothers live in the Mosby Northwest electorate, and they come here every day to fetch at least 100 liters of water for their families' daily use. 
In Yanguru Sausia district, families in 18 wards now have access to clean water supply under the district's WASH program. There is a, a very strong and dynamic relationship between accessibility to WASH health indicators and other social indicators. So we believe that uh, uh, Yanguru Sausia district is a model district in, in Papua New Guinea with a very specific and strategic focus on on WASH. And today, at this announcement, we are thankful that we are the partner that will implement the 20th rural WASH project in the district. Since independence, most towns and district headquarters in Papua New Guinea lack proper water supply. They depend on rivers or use tanks. However, in areas where there is little or no rainfall at all, Mothers take on the burden to find water and many travel miles to fetch water. First time I've been kissing Antalo, this la hape. Na lo hape, all been rousing, sa fiwe kam go, all been rousing mi playa. All been put it up na. Upside water, I am sa kam lick, 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 na mi playa sa stab. O sem sol na, kontena line, I am sa go, na go lo backside o getaya. Na ol mama mi playa sa cross, pussy kontena go kam, sa everyday life, mi playa sa miki this la woke. I'm inside the most pin, I'm block low, kid is like me block to feel him or some. Some like I'm life, me block low, leave him inside the city stop. In building wash facilities at community levels, the wash policy aims to limit the distance women travel to fetch water, cut down water borne diseases, and improve hygiene for locals, especially in rural areas. Today we are presenting Adra half a million to build a town water supply system in Kubalia station. It's one of my two main stations in my district, that's Yanguru and that's Kubalia. In that program, we are going to supply water to Kubalia Secondary School, Health Center, Primary School, all the town, all the public servants are going to be um, provided water through that project. Thekla Gunga, National MTV News. The National Capital District today launched the Respect the City campaign to teach city residents respect and hygiene. The campaign is supported by CPL Group of Companies. The Respect the City campaign was launched today by NCD Governor Powers Parkop at CPL Stop and Shop Harbour City branch in Port Mosby. Witnessing the launch was CPL's Managing Director, Se Mahesh Patel, Ranu Guri Youths and the public at Harbour City. In the past, you know, come up with a boy band, that's not an easy decision to make, but it's something that we have to do in order to shake up our people. Now we are trying, maybe I could say, a softer approach. Educating, getting our people to come on board, but at the same time, enforcing. We have tried to stop people chewing, and it's going to take a very, very long time. But at least start with hygiene. At least start with respect. There are places where you can throw your buai, skins and things. Do it in the rubbish bins. Don't throw it out on the streets. Because it not only causes a health risk, but it also does not look good if you're a proud city resident. So. NCDC has engaged youths from Ranuguri as volunteers for this campaign in this part of the city. They will be stationed here at the Stop and Chop Harbour City, cleaning the betel nut stains and ensuring the area is clean at all times. Stop and Chop will be providing gloves, detergents, brushes and brooms. Putting very tough rules have not been working, with city residents continuing to spit betel nut everywhere. Spitting is a big problem. Spitting with bitter nuts spittle. Not only it shows that you don't respect the city, but it also shows that you are a responsible person. Well, you know, something to tumble shows. I say, you man, you beg it. You see, spit me. Must be in a spit or rubbish or something. All man had no control. But I've been placed. People are not cleaning me. Some of you have been very used. People are not payment. I must know what the six months now go with the work nothing. Bitter, thank you, Lord. For the youths, volunteering is a start to keep them busy and take ownership of the city they call home. 
NCDC will assist them in setting up SMEs with the governor encouraging private sectors to get on board this campaign to engage the youth in cleaning activities. Vanilla farmers in Milim Bay have been given the support to embrace the crop in the region. A vanilla expo was held in Galubwa village, attended by farmers, members of the Spice Board and Vice Minister for Agriculture, Henry Amuli. A memorandum of agreement was also signed between the Edke Foundation with stakeholders paving way for coordination to harness vanilla production. Vanilla farmers in Millen Bay gathered on Ferguson Island to attend the expo. With much anticipation to revive the crop and embrace its productivity, Vice Minister for Agriculture and the EdK Foundation attended as the key stakeholders. A memorandum of understanding was also signed and will now tie all stakeholders together. So the cooperatives will take the lead in maintaining and sustaining work in the local level. And care will be uh, concentrating on the regional level or provincial level, but we will be working, having cooperatives to ensure that our cooperatives working under Ed care work with us to take care of the farmers. In Millen Bay, the vanilla program is in its second phase with 600 farmers in profile. For locals in Galubwa, a total of 38,000 vines have been planted with one to two tons expected to be harvested next year. Interest has grown in the area with a model farmer saying inconsistency in price has been an issue but not for now. Me against them vanilla because there's a time in planning pest. Now vanilla will be in market and will discourage. Vanilla farmers around Millen Bay attended showcasing the produce. The chairman of the PNG Spice Board encouraged farmers to till the land and support the government grow the vanilla industry and the economy. So now I'm going to get big blood tintin. Tintin blog and I'm looking for the man Mary must go down on the ground. Suppose you mean long Latin by Bell Blomi Blah by no Kai Kai. With groundwork progressing, the Vice Minister for Agriculture says the government will support farmers to ensure farmers are given the know-how and financial support right to exporting. We will continue to support EDRA. We will continue to support all the farmers that you put in more effort. Now you work him on a finger blue dirty. We will continue to support this project. The three-day vanilla expo ended with hopes of making Millen Bay hit the top list of producing high-quality vanilla bins. Jack LaPave Jr. National MTV News. It doesn't hurt to give and make someone feel special and appreciated. Maso Oguna, a vegetable farmer, and his wife were over the moon when Century Hotel in Port Moresby invited them as their hotel guest for a day. Maso Oguna and wife Jesse spent last night here at the Sanctuary Hotel thanks to the staff and management. They took a day off from their busy schedule of minding their bok choy and Ibika gardens in the hot put Mosby sun and their market table for a day of relaxation. So me to go to thing and we to talk. one night hotel now. Thank you. Maso is a Lutheran revival pastor and has been living in Port Moresby for many years. Gardening and selling garden produce was the best option to support his family while carrying out his ministry work. They started supplying Sanctuary Hotel with garden produce when owner James Pang stopped by at their roadside market to purchase some fresh coconut or cool out. My wife came up with this, this particular uh, idea here to uh, reward the local farmers for all the hard work they do. I don't, don't think they get recognised enough for, you know, the hardships that they go through just to bring us, you know, good quality produce. 
This is not the first and the hotel plans to give back to ordinary Papua New Guineans this way. Maso was even served the kulau he sells to Sanctuary Hotel in hotel style. The couple spent the night at the hotel's deluxe king rooms with complimentary breakfast and dinner. And now looking at the Nest Fund market report, the Kina opened unchanged at 0.2860 US dollars in the interbank market this morning. At Bank South Pacific, the Kina is buying 0.2785 US dollars, 0.3910 Australian dollars, 0.4168 New Zealand dollars and 28.51 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York Close, gold is trading higher. Coffee, cocoa and copra closed lower. Crude oil is trading higher. Palm oil closed higher and copper closed lower. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed higher. The ASX 200 is trading lower and the All Ordinaries is trading higher. When we come back, more disappointed punters don't betting in the Melbourne Cup. Welcome back to the news. Melbourne Cup punters who didn't get to place their bets today were disappointed after learning that betting shops will be open again tomorrow. Some of them travelled in from Eastern Highlands hoping lay betting shops would be open today. At one of the oldest betting locations in Lay City, the place was unusually quiet. The National Gaming Board issued nationwide notices advising punters that betting shops would be closed and of all days on Melbourne Cup Day. Those who didn't get the memo showed up and were, as expected, terribly disappointed. At the Morbe bookmakers a block away from the main market, locked doors and COVID-19 warnings greeted those who came in early as 5 a.m. to place their bets. Many said if rugby league games were held with little regard for COVID-19 restrictions, what's the difference? David travelled in from Okapa. He didn't come alone. He brought with him several busloads of his Okapa one talks. Some of them are now stranded. Those who placed bets and won are celebrating tonight. Those who didn't, well, there's always next year. If COVID-19 goes away. Scott Wade on a Melbourne Cup day that didn't quite happen. National MTV News, Lay. And turning abroad, the famous horse race that stops two nations and thousands of workplaces wrapped up today. There's a big difference in this year's Melbourne Cup. No spectators at the track. Still coming from Sir Dragon, a master of reality. Down the outside, Russian Camelot. Twilight payment at the 300 metres. Still three weeks Finch. Tiger Moth, the chosen one, running on with Russian Camelot and Persan. Twilight payment tries to break their hearts. Tiger Moth wearing chosen one. It's Twilight Payment. Tiger Moth still trying to get there. Twilight Payment. What a ride. What a win. In a cup we'll never forget. Has won it from Tiger Moth and Prince of Aaron third. For fourth photos, the chosen one, Persan, from Very Elegant. And behind them, Sir Dragon A. But in stark contrast, in Melbourne, which still has COVID restrictions, fans in New Zealand flock to race courses across the country this afternoon. Dressed in their best and arriving in numbers. <laughs> the scenes at Weenatui Racecourse in Otago very different to those in Melbourne. Horses parading to empty grandstands at Flemington, dressed up commentators in the studio, doing their best to capture some excitement, even if it meant crossing to Auckland. I mean, just look at the crowd behind us right now. Oh! Australian punters no doubt envious of the fun. Otago University students partying up a storm and making sure to get something for the gram. Here we are at Wingerella Racecourse. 
race three. The thousands of race goers, old and young, making the most of the warm spring weather. Yeah, I just like finished my exams and just now I'm here. Race three, yeah, three. course nine. The bets coming in thick and fast. Go, go! How'd you go, mate? What does it look like? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure he didn't get up. <laughs> Auckland's Ellerslie Raceway also pulled in big numbers. I have friends of mine in Melbourne and they're like, oh my god, you're going to Ellerslie? I'm like, yes, hell yeah. People around the world watch us able to attend these events and um, they, it, they find it a bit bizarre. And the action wasn't all on the track. Auckland's Viaduct hosting plenty of fascinators and fancy threads. Some punters laying out huge sums. And we've got a big betting syndicate of $115,000 with 900 people all across New Zealand involved. So looking to have a $50,000 bet on the Melbourne Cup. A Melbourne Cup day like no other. But Kiwi's still lucky enough to keep up the tradition and maybe even take home a win. Truco Sports is next. Fideli Sukina has the details. Thank you, Charmaine. Hakari manager impressed with talents displayed in Central Province and 24 teams set to take part in the Sports Talk 7s competition. Join me after the break. Tukai Sports. Good night and welcome to Trukai Sports. Two players from the Kalo Football Association in the Central Province have caught the eyes of Vonnie Capinato, manager of Hecari United. Mrs. Capinato was impressed with the raw talent displayed during the grand final of the Kalo Football Association. The soccer grand final in Kala Village over the weekend opened doors for two local players who now have a chance to be part of a semi-professional football club, the Hekari United FC, a club that holds the record for most titles in the Papua New Guinea National Soccer League. Today I have scouted two players again that I would take them to our club, Hekari United Football Club. The opportunity presented for the two does come with conditions as outlined by the club managers. And I want to see many young people become great leaders in your country, in your family. And when coming to Hikari, it is a, a different thing. I can be there for you, I can care for you and love you. But if you are not disciplined, there is very hard uh, consequences to those players. Vonnie adding success only comes with discipline. One very important thing is discipline. There is no way you will be succeed if you are not a disciplined person. The visiting elites of the code also braced the villages with an announcement of Kalo's own products and two national players, the Kepo brothers, Ati and Kolu, who will be traveling abroad to play in the Solomon Islands. And I want to announce today that Ati and Kolu are invited to play in our big league in Solomon Islands, and they will be traveling to Solomon Islands when the, when the borders are open, and I hope next month then they are going to Solomon Islands to play for Solomon Islands uh, National League. Kilawani, Trukai Sports. And six pools have been confirmed for the third annual Sports Talk 7s to be held from the 28th to the 29th of November in Port Moresby. 12 teams from outside provinces will be taking part with 12 teams based in the city of Port Moresby. A total of 24 teams have confirmed to participate in the seventh tournament hosted by Quantum Media under the Sports Talk magazine. Coming over from Kimbe. The Sports Talk 7th tournament has gained much attention and is heading into its third year and teams keep on flying into the capital city for some rugby union 7th competition. This year's tournament will feature 24 teams with teams from Leh, Medang, Kimbe, Buka, Wiwek, Lihir and Rabaul making the journey to Port Mosby for the two-day tournament from the 28th to the 29th of November. The draws were finalized on Saturday with a live draw by tournament director Paul Joseph 
in front of fans that turned up for the Capital Rugby Union competition on Saturday. The Arab Barbarians came from Buka. So that makes up uh, Pule. Uh, from the 24 teams, we have uh, 12 from outside centers, 12 within Port Mosby, from both uh, Port Mosby comp, rugby comp. So from the 12 outside, we have uh, four from Lay, three from Medang, one from Wewek, that's uh, from uh, Mamase, and we have uh, NGI, we have Lear. Uh, Rabaul, Stallions, and then we have Arab uh, Barbarians. With the conclusion of the Trans Highway 7s in Ley, outside teams are rearing at the opportunity for more Sevens action. The organizers of the tournament, Quantum Media, under their Sports Talk magazine, have a keen interest in creating opportunities for Rugby Sevens talent to get exposure with Sports Talk General Manager Benson Upas stressing that Sevens Rugby has much to offer for the young enthusiasts that play the sport. Rugby Sevens is a world uh, Olympic game and we believe that uh, if, we, if anyone can provide the opportunity uh, and we are able to do that and we want to provide this opportunity for uh, our rugby talent to have the opportunity to you know, uh, play in Olympics if PNG qualifies. PNG Rugby Sevens qualifies and yeah, so forth. Uh, the international, there's a lot of international uh, tournaments for Rugby Sevens, so uh, we want to provide this opportunity for them. Despite the tournament being moved to November, the organizers have put in incentives for the cup winner. 10,000 kina plus, uh, uh, plus a set of rugby uniform from our sister brand Tati Sports, uh, just to promote that. Uh, promote the standard of the tournament so that every team that participates and wins wears the jersey and play in the next tournament. But the total prize money would be about 30-35,000 kinos. So, yeah. And Trukai Sports continues with Melbourne Cup race and boxing. Stay with us. Trukai Sports And welcome back to Trukai Sports. For the first time in over 150 years, the Melbourne Cup proceeded without crowds at the famous Flemington Raceway. But despite COVID-19 restrictions, the race itself sure did deliver. From the anthem sung to an empty Flemington, to the jockey's newest fashion accessories, this was definitely a different looking Melbourne Cup. But the horses were there and once they were in the starting gates, things started to look a lot more like normal. Crash and they're racing in the Melbourne Cup. Over the 3,200 metre race, people don't often pay attention to the early leader, so twilight payments two lengths probably didn't seem like much. But remember, in 2020, things don't always go to plan. And as the race unfolded, first time Melbourne Cup jockey Jai McNeil remained in control. Twilight payments looking to pinch the cup. The question was, would anyone catch him? The answer, no. What a ride, what a win, in a cup we'll never forget. Too many emotions, you know? It's a very big moment. Um, Jess and the boy Oakley will be watching from home today. While most of us would rather forget 2020, it'll be hard to beat for Jockey McNeil, who welcomed his first child and has now claimed racing's biggest prize. He didn't care that there were only a few people there to celebrate with. Well, usually there'll be 100,000 fans cheering right now. With McNeil's family unable to be in the stands, they tuned in from wherever they could. I'm sure Dad will be watching from his phone on the tractor. He had a bit of hay to do today. It was a clean sweep for the internationals this year. While Twilight Payments win is good news for Irish trainer Joseph Joseph O'Brien, his dad Aidan's horse Anthony Van Dyke had to be put down after pulling up on the final straight. 2020, it really has been a tough year for many, but for some, it'll be one to remember for good reason. And to boxing, New Zealand's junior Faz Kemp has revealed one of the weapons they believe will be trouble for his competitor, Joseph Parker. This is how Junior Far usually fights in the orthodox stance, his left hand and left foot leading. But how's this for a bit of mind games? To prepare for Parker, he's also been training as a southpaw, the opposite stance, mixing things up. When we saw you in southpaw, do you tend to fight in a bit of both? Was that a new thing? Uh, it's, it's a bit of new, like I kind of, um, I, I kind of played around with it when I was an amateur. See what happens on fight night. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see that would work against Joe? Possibly. 
We'll see. So is it a big deal? Far's manager seems to think so. We also know that Joseph doesn't like Southpaws, so we've been training Southpaw for, a, well, to be honest, probably the whole time for this. Eh? Parker KO'd his one and only Southpaw opponent, Jason Bergman, four years ago. But Far's camp... No, it was a difficult adjustment for Parker during the build-up. Uh, you know, a few things about this camp that uh, have, have concerned me. Like, Joe's probably been hit more uh, with this sparring partner than any other sparring partner. Whether or not Far is serious about taking advantage, Parker now has a sparring partner that fights both Orthodox and Southpaw. In a closed session, David Nika began training with Parker today. This is him previously in Far's camp. One News understands the Com Games golden boy is looking to make his pro debut on the Parker Far undercard before competing at the Olympics. There is the ability for David to turn pro and stay amateur. Um, there's some complexity around it where Boxing New Zealand have to be the um, sanctioning body. Adding some golden glow to a main event where the mind games have well and truly begun. And that, that story wraps up Trukai Sports. Charmaine will be back with the weather report for the next 24 hours. Bye for now. True Kai Sports. True Kai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. Weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region. Port Moresby rain showers likely with light thunder in inland then fine morning. In Dara rain showers and possible thunder tonight fine partly cloudy morning. Karama thunder showers tonight. Alotau thunder showers tonight and fine partly cloudy morning. And Popondeta a few rain showers tonight and fine partly cloudy morning. The weather update was proudly brought to you by Money Plus, with you always. And that's been the news, sports and weather for today, Tuesday the 3rd of November 2020. On behalf of the news team, pleasant viewing, good night.